Hello and welcome to the Live Free and Ham podcast, our bi-weekly show exploring ham radio topics in New Hampshire, New England, and beyond. Whether you're a licensed, regular licensed uh, ham uh, radio operator or first-time guest, we're excited to have you here and we appreciate your support. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. So uh, for today, my name is Ryan, W1SNH, and I'm joined here with my two co-hosts. Uh, Eric, uh, November 1, Juliet United Radio. Todd, W1STJ. All right, guys. So before we get into uh, tonight's topic, what's been going on in uh, your week of ham radio? Eric? Uh, my week of ham radio. Well, uh, I've been um, battling more sound-related issues, uh, but uh, my shack I've been trying to refine a bit to you know both be in the streaming world and work with my flex. Um, as you can tell, it's in the background, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to use a lot of my resources together and, you know, as with anything, when you go down that rabbit hole, you just open up a lot of more problems before you get to solutions. And so I'm hopefully on the upside of that and getting into the solution side of it and, uh, making some progress to eventually uh, get to a, a well-oiled sound configuration and be able to, you know, optimize it with my flex and, you know, the flex in general has already got a great EQ and a whole bunch of other things. I've had great reports just alone on the microphone. So I'm assuming once I get to the, you know, the actual soundboard, I'll be, you know, that much sweeter, but uh, you know, maybe five DB above, you know, the, the noise level of other people. So, you know, Hey, we'll, we'll see how it goes, but uh, that's, that's where I've been kind of banging uh, out stuff. Uh, I haven't had too much, time with uh you know nehf i mean i played a little fta here and there um but yeah as as the crow flies uh it's been all about the sound and trying to tweak that stuff out and, and get that going so i know in the audiovisual uh industry that's a uh that's huge you know getting that uh that gain set and get everything uh, leveled out um, yeah have there been any recent uh purchases of uh audio uh, mixing boards or anything like that oh yeah yeah there there's the i i tried to do analysis paralysis with you know researching you know digital audio workstations thinking that's the route to go bought down you know went down that rabbit hole realized it's not the rabbit hole i should have gone down and and so i finally uh just decided that the mixer that i'm going to be replacing i i've got a current yamaha mixer it's a little old outdated um it gives me fits um, you know, every once in a while with audio and, and whatnot. And so it just, it, it needs to kind of find a new home or be used in a small little, you know, uh, primitive setup where, you know, I'm, you know, not beating on it so much. So I've got a personas coming, hopefully, uh, eight channel, um, digital, uh, actually, no, it's an analog digital. So, you know, I have the capabilities, but either way, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I'll be able to fix it. And you know, Ryan's commenting on my audio. Once again, this is the reason why I'm replacing this damn thing <laughs> because it's so horrible in terms of like not keeping my audio level consistent. <laughs> All right. Well, it's uh, definitely, maybe that's a, a subject for a future uh, podcast show. Yeah, so, that, that's a big one. <laughs> excellent. Todd, how about yourself? How's your past week? Well, um, I've been buying, spending money again, not a lot of money, but some money I, uh, I got all my parts for my Go Box. Uh, those all came in from uh, DX or from Amazon. The, the last couple parts, uh, the other parts came from DX Engineering, and I ended up buying a, uh, a Parrot headset for when I'm doing um, working on my Flex Radio from work when I'm on my iPad because I was getting a lot of reports that I was um, my audio wasn't too well, and I was using. Um, bone condensing headphones that I use just at work to listen to stuff. Mm -hmm. So I did some research and I ended up getting these parrot headphones. And fortunately uh, on Wednesday, I was able to uh, do a contact with a uh, ham out in Pisa, Italy, and he was doing a live stream. So I had the headphones first time made the contact, had a QSO, went back to the live stream, could hear me. I sounded pretty good. I'm like, well, that must fix the problem. Oh. So that was, uh, that was a little luck, but uh, I like them. They're good. They're uh, noise canceling and they, uh, it's only one headset and one boom mic. And then the other side's your ear is open, which helps me at work. Cause if, if I got totally noise canceling, I might miss a kid calling out or something, yeah. <laughs> needing some help. So, uh, but yeah, they're pretty compact and uh, it's going to be good. So now I feel like uh, my, uh, ipad and mobile flex uh situation is uh good to go that's very cool now the parrot is that a, a brand name or a style no it's a um i think it's made by jabra 
Okay. Um, I think it's just their brand name for their headsets. It's it, this headset is was really made for like answering telephone calls and stuff. Okay. Um, so I figured, and it's, spe- it's specifically used for um, uh, iOS and, and and tablets and phones. It's not really meant for logging onto the computer. Mm-hmm. So that was a review and it got a lot of good reviews and I figured I'd try it out. And if I didn't like it, I could always return it, but I like it. Excellent. Well, that's very cool. Yeah. This past week I've been, uh, so I, I went through and tried, well, I figured out which States I'm still missing for my worked off 50 for the, uh, POTA hunting. Let me guess. Yeah. You got them all done though. <laughs> well, no. So I've been whittling away. That's, I've been more di- uh, diligently looking at the website, figuring out which States are online, you know, or, or transmitting and uh, going down the list. So I uh, still got a couple of outliers, got that North Dakota and Idaho. Uh-huh. And surprisingly, uh, the POTA uh, activators who are in uh, either Rhode Island or Maine, two states I need, uh, my signals keep going over the top of them. I can't, oh. I, I can't hear them at all. So and I know they're there because I can hear other people calling into them. So Spin just the beam sideways just so it comes off the side of the beam and you might yeah. have <laughs> no, just been whittling away at that. So you, trying to get that you can't get you can't get uh twenty meters to Maine. I don't only hit Maine pretty easily. It it's hit or miss for me. So yeah, huh. where really they are. Yep. Maybe it's that huge antenna you have, it's just uh overpowering. You know, oh, he does drop have a down wire too. He's still got a wire, it's not you know totally uh you know, way still only, you know 100 watts. So, <laughs> yeah, what uh, well, you know, it's like I, you know, I, I it's weird because you know, sometimes I'll get on 20 meters and I'll you know, I'll be hunting and I'll say, like, oh, I'll see someone in like Pennsylvania, I always get Pennsylvania, but then other times there'll be you can't hear them but you get florida good or if you get florida yeah. you always get florida then all of a sudden florida is like nowhere to be sound like you get new mexico so it's really weird that how it when well, it was also interesting during the, the summer during the 13 colonies uh contest that you know some of the closer states most of the time i was having difficulty hearing them because they're too close but then i'm not sure if they switched operators you know if maybe they were vertically polarized versus horizontally or you know what type of equipment they were running but when the operator changed, boom, all of a sudden I could hear him and I got that contact. So, yeah. Now, you know, just, uh, you know, question for you. Actually, two questions popped on. First one is how are you tracking all of your, like, the, are you just going up to the POTA app site or are you get using like Ham Alert or what? Um, for when you want to work a certain, area, you know, state or you're looking for a park in that certain state? Well, I'm using the, uh, the Tim method. So I got paper and a pencil here on which states I need. (laughs) God rest. And then when, uh, I see the state posted on the uh, website, then I try working them. Okay. (laughs) So what I, what I've done on Hamler is I found, um, a guy on the thing, I, I see, I'll see like Alaska. I need Alaska, right? And I see that this guy, and then he has a YouTube page and he on a, on a website and he activates and he films everything. Mm-hmm. So I put him on my hammerler. And of course, like, and he'll do all different bands. So like, I'm like, he's like, oh, when 10 meters was going, I'm going to activate 10 meters this afternoon. So now I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And then 10 meters is dead and I can't hear anything. You know, well, then the next, the next night he's doing 20 and 10's booming. I'm like, I'm never going to get this guy. Well, and I did. He, I heard him once pretty good and I could not get break the pile up. I was so cl- I'm like, I hear this guy. I know he could possibly hear me, but it just wasn't meant to be. So when that alert goes off and it's like you guys, I'm like, yeah, they're just, you know, messing around. But when that thing guy comes up, I'm like, drop whatever I'm doing. <laughs> Here, here's a little ham, ham alert secret sauce. And I mean, it's obviously not, I put a video out a while back on it, but um, if you go into ham alert, you can actually set it by state. So you, like, you know, if you want to do parks like that are all just in Alaska, no matter mm-hmm. who it is, so you don't have to do it by call sign. So anytime someone in Alaska activates, I get a notice, you know, from whatever call sign. I just have to remember to go back in. If like, if I haven't seen that call sign, I have to remember what that one was related to because it could be anybody random calls. But sure. Right. Yeah. That might be a way to be able to help. Yeah, and I, I've worked Alaska from the natural rail trail doing POTA. Except it wasn't a guy at a park. It wasn't a park to park. It was just a guy in like, it was, I think it was North Pole, Alaska. Oh, wow. And it was like five, nine, hmm. 20 meters. I was like, great. I'm like, oh, I'm like, you aren't by chance at a park, are you? Yeah. Well, you, like, you got regular you, go to- <laughs> you don't have photos. What? <laughs> you have regular world yeah. states. <laughs> yeah, right. I think I've got all states regular, but just parks on the area. 
Yeah. I don't know how many parks are out in Alaska. Like, I, I can't imagine there's a ton of them, but no. they're, they're really big. <laughs> yeah, they're really big. And there's, and I'm sure, I mean, this guy that I got, and I have to, I'll let you guys know his call sign, but he's like, he's like out in like frigid, like 20 below, and he's in those tents, and, you know, he's out on the lake, and he's, you know, he's hardcore. Was that, <laughs> uh, is that KL7EC or something like that? Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, he's got a yeah, he's, YouTube channel. If you want to check him out, I, I really like him. He's done uh, some really good videos, and you know, he's he's really good in the springtime when they have spring up there. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's when I found him, and it was in the spring. And then, like I said, I haven't seen him lately. So maybe he's maybe he's down south uh, enjoying some warmer weather. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> cool. Well, very cool. So, uh, topic for this week. I'm the uh, outlier here in their three person group. So. Or my two other co-hosts here are new proud owners of Flex Radio. Mm. So we thought it'd be uh, kind of interesting to go through. And uh, we're joking around before the show of this being an intervention for uh, to you. Flex Radio. <laughs> <laughs> for me. But uh, I just want to uh, get your guys' uh, input on the radio and uh, bounce it back and forth between the current Fle- uh, Flex Radio and your previous Yesus and Icoms and other radios you've used in the past. So what, uh, Eric? Oh, well, okay, fine. I'll take it first, but you know I'm more new than Todd is. Uh, you know, since Which, he's had it a little longer. Yeah. So why did you, why did you choose a switch over flex? Uh, the simple answer is peer pressure. But <laughs> you know, I, 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 I. So my my story kind of goes back a little bit um, from a conversation I had with a couple other club or one other club member who was a big flex owner and has been a flex owner for quite a while. Um, and, uh, he kind of, you know, showed me the, the light as they say, or the truth. Um, and I kind of, you know, said, Oh, cool. This is somewhere I want to go. And, and I looked at the, you know, initial sticker shock and, you know, I said, ah, well, maybe some other time in the future, I still need to kind of feel my way through what it feels like to actually, you know, get a true real ham radio. I started it with a 450, um, Yezu 450, and that was a great little radio, which my dad has now. And, I've got now the uh, DX10, and that's a great radio, and that's being used and being demoed by another ham. So we'll eventually convert him to, you know, uh, being a Yezu owner, hopefully. Uh, if you're listening, Tim, yes, we're talking about you. Um, and then, um, you know, in all of the the lack of not having uh, enough, uh, you know, HF in my life uh, and actually seeing Todd with all of his uh, enjoyment, uh, he lent me his login. Um, which, you know, really only cemented the deal at that point. I kind of just really pulled the trigger and, and, uh, you know, I actually, it worked out good because they had a couple of really good deals and, you know, I ended up coming out with a, fl- a hat, a shirt and the control knob, which still gives me the feel, the tactile feel that I still love as a, you know, you know, having a VFO knob that, that when you play with radios and you like the hands-on stuff, you know, when you go to flex, it's, it's a whole new, and we'll get into it, but it's a whole new world of, you know, more software than it is, say, hardware, but it's super powerful and, you know, it's not lacking by any stretch of imagination. So that's kind of where I kind of came from, you know, in, in my journey to get to that point. And I'm still in the midst of it, but, you know, it, it, and it's going to be a long road for sure. Excellent. So, Todd, your uh, your story about why you chose the FLEX is interesting. You want to tell us about that? Yeah. Well, I wanted to I wanted to build a go box <clears throat> after seeing Ryan's and um, at field day, and I said I got to get one of these. So I was looking at different radios. I was looking at the 991A um, <clears throat> and was going to purchase that. And then talking to W1WRA uh, Bill, who's the president of our club, the big flex owner, uh, he told me I should look into a flex. And then I started looking into it, reading about it, asking him questions, watching YouTube videos, seeing all the reviews, and um, we would get together at different events or whatever, or just meetups, and he would uh, show me on his phone how, how easy it was and how it worked. And I'm doing some overnight shifts uh, at the detention center, and uh, I couldn't access my radio, and that was the biggest reason is like, okay, if I'm going to spend money on a go box. I'm still not going to have the remote access. So, and then Ryan's big thing is buy once, cry once. And uh, <laughs> I kind of took that advice and I, I, I pulled the trigger and I was very hesitant to do it. Um, but I'm glad I did it because I've just been having a blast with it. And I, I've been able to do so much more radio uh, while, you know, third shift, you're not doing much. I'm sitting here watching kids sleep 
and there's a lot of time on your hands. So uh, mm-hmm. I can throw up the old iPad and um, connect to my, my radio at home and uh, I can have all kinds of fun. So that was really the deal. And then I, I looked at it this way too, is uh, I'm, I'm going to have my DX10 in a go box, which I'm going to use for a POTA. And, um, and I was bringing my DX10 to field days. So that's going to be kind of a cool thing. So I'll still be able to use my DX10 because for no reason, I love my DX10. I've always loved it. I've never had any problems with it, but I also love my flex radio. I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. all, it's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So your primary reason was uh, remote connectivity and having that uh, um, ease of operation on the iPad. Yeah. It wasn't even so much the iPad. It was, it was more of, I wanted to be able to, I, I've been so busy that I haven't had a lot of time to play radio and I enjoy it. And then the only time that I really have, I'm kind of bored not being able to do anything is when I'm working these overnight shifts mm-hmm. and I couldn't access my DX10. And I looked into it because Yesu has some kind of thing you can activate it, but I don't think you can like control everything. Mm-hmm. And when I was talking to Bill about it, he was like, you know, you can do all that from your phone or your iPad. So uh, I got it. I said, all right, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. And I was really hesitant. I'm like, you know, this is, am I really going to use this? Is it going to work? I just waste my money. And then it came and it was super light and I plugged it in and we got it all set up and, you know, I downloaded the software. And next thing you know, I'm like, wow, I'm at work. And I'm just like, going. all of a sudden I'm like here. And, and, and since then I've, uh, and I've probably talked about this before, but I, I've, I've been working on uh, New Zealand, New Cardonia and Australia. Like it's no tomorrow hmm. on 20 meters at like two, three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and it's been great. It's almost like getting boring. I'm like, Oh, it's just Australia again. Like, can I get some other country? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. That's on sideband, right? Voice. Yep. Yeah. Wow. That's great. And I've done, and I've done a lot of, um, Barefoot. FTA, um, yeah. And I had a guy, I think it was last week. We, uh, we both were barefoot and he was on a, a beam about 20 feet off the ground. And my wires are about 20 feet off the ground and we're hunting. We were about a five, six to five, seven both ways. Wow. So that was pretty cool. But yeah, so it's, um, it's been a game changer. I, I was like, Eric, I, I liked touching the knobs. Like the DX 10 is kind of like, you can either touch knobs or press the screen or do a combination of both. Uh, one of the things with the flex that I actually liked is, you know, I liked the, having the, the VFO knob, but you can't do it on the iPad or the iPhone, but you can on the computer and the, the scroll wheel on your mouse will move the VFO knob and on my mouse, I can turn the click off and just make it free reign. So uh, I've kind of still have a little bit of that tactile stuff, but Ryan's going to bring, I mean, Eric's going to bring over his knob, uh, I think on Friday and I'm going to give that a shot and see if, uh, if I like it even more. Oh, but you, you will work. <laughs> guarantee. So in, in, that's one of the questions I had on the transition from uh, hardware or software, not having that uh, tactile feel anymore. Um, Eric, what do you think is just having that single VFO knob? Is, is that enough to kind of quench that old uh, habit pattern or? Uh, yes, I would say the knob does very much the it fills that void and does a little bit more. It's got the, the people who designed the knob, it, the, I assume there weren't part of flex or I, I don't know the history behind it. But in essence, it's, it's literally the size of probably a pack of cards and you know with a little bit of an angle but the knob is the same thing on any other vfo so you get that speed you know you get that tactile feel being able to spin up and down the band pretty quickly um one of the things i you know in that transition from going from physical to you know software you just kind of like you know you you can do it it's not a big deal and it's not like a first world problem for me but it's it's like you know if i want to go to a certain part of the band um, yeah, I can click there and I'm in, but if I want to drill down a little bit more and I want to like really dial that in, you really like that VFO knob. You really like to be able to get in front of that radio and bring it up like a couple of kilohertz or a hundred kilohertz just to get it zoned in. And with the mouse, um, you know, because I don't have the, the, the flywheel with me or if you're on an iPad or an iPhone, you really don't have that capability. You have to kind of just zoom and pinch and stuff like that. So it's a little tough, mm-hmm. but once you get over kind of the, and anybody who makes that leap to flex, I, you know, my first suggestion is, is any of your preconceived notions of owning a prior radio, just take them off the plate and just look at it as like, this is your first time playing with something and you're not going to, you know, know anything from what it used to be to where it is today. And then just, you know, learn and, and, and be, you know, learn how to, you know, kind of, you know, 
be excited about the process and deal with all the frustrations of trying to figure things out and, and whatnot, because it's definitely a journey for sure. You so, know, and, oh, go ahead, Todd. Um, so for me, um, being new and only had like the DX10 was my first HF radio and I had to learn all that. I was still, I'm still learning that one going to the flex. It was just like, just something new I had to learn. So I, um, you know, I, I just kept going at it. And like I said, I, I found it very easy. Um, a couple things, you know, I, I'd ask Bill like, Hey, how do I do this? Or how do I do that? Once he showed me how to do it, it started to make sense. Mm-hmm. The more you play with it, the more you get used to it. I, I would compare it to like, maybe if you can remember, like if we were all on PCs and the first time you went to a Mac, right. It's kind of the same, a little different. You get used to it. And then once you start doing it, like for me, I can switch from iOS to OS to PC strip, like no problem. Like I just do it. Right. It's kind yeah. of like driving a car automatic or standard. If you know how to drive standard, you get in the car and you just drive. It's not like you're thinking about it. So that's been a pretty good um, thing for me and what I like about it. But like I said, the, the negative thing is like, you know, when you have your shack, like my flex is on the rack, which is underneath my desk. So you only <laughs> see your radio. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's I mean, it's it's not about looking at what you're looking at. It's more about like, what are you, you know, who are you making contacts with? And and like I said, the, the filtering, I thought the DX10 had unbelievable filtering and the flex is just, I mean, I'm sorry, it blows it away. Yeah, really? I mean, you can, you can, you can take the noisiest station and you can get rid of all that noise and, and just you hear take the talk. noisiest band, like 20 meters, yeah. like the soul cycle right now is kind of like touch and go and no, 20 meters can be super noisy. You turn on AGCT, tune it to the point where you're just dialing out the noise and anything above that signal wise just gets boosted through the roof so like i've worked parks that if i put on my dx10 and i try to dial it in and use a contour and whatnot i could get it close enough but i'd still hear a lot of the noise just to be able to pick them out I, with the flex it's just like you tune it i was like oh my gosh i can hear this guy and i can hear him loud and it's like guess what when i you know transmit he's like hearing me he's like dude you're a five nine or you know most of the guys i get like it's a five nine and not to say that the flex is going to guarantee a five nine every time you do it but you know you just you cut through you know a lot of the the noise interesting all right cool um so what you're saying is if I connect a flex to my big antenna, I can get oh, north of good. Dude, you would be in Yeah, <laughs> you'll get – listen, if you get a flex and you, you're you going to be giving us your, your password and things so we can use your antenna. Yeah, yeah so you, yeah. my advice – and this is kind of like – so if you're thinking about going down that road, Flex has an awesome YouTube channel, and I spent – like a whole entire week, every chance I got just studying the videos, learning about the tool sets, seeing the remote option. They, they, you know, that's the biggest thing with flex is that it's meant to be a remote solution. I mean, not all together, but in essence, you could put it somewhere remotely with no noise floor and, you know, work amazing DX, you know, because then at that point you're just setting up the right antennas, you're setting up, you know, good receivers and, you know, you're doing all the right things to make it work. And, you know, it just becomes a so much better experience, especially when you want to cut through like all of the other, you know, noise that's, you know, in and around the bands or whatever. So, before we kind of continue on the uh, pros of the radio and going down that road, what are, is there anything you regret or wish mm. it had or it did better? Or is there any, what, what are the negatives of it? Yeah, that's a tough one. I wouldn't say negatives. Um, because I haven't like, I'm not like a season pro by any stretch of imagination. And if you're on the news group, you know, on every, you know, Facebook group or, you know, groups IO or even just, you know, a message board, you always get the folks that are just like the hardcore DXers and they're like, well, it does this or it doesn't do that. The The best thing I can say is that whatever you've learned about het, uh, super het type radios, just, you know, put it off to the side. Just forget about it because in essence, it doesn't apply because it's direct sampling. You you have a whole entire thing to learn. And so if you think from a super het perspective, then you're just like frustrated all the time. It's like, well, why can't I tone this out or why can't I notch this out? And it's like it's there's no need for those controls. And so how to get back to the the idea of like anything I regret? Well, my only struggle was is that you know because i'm not a a well-seasoned person and and this is what i would say to anybody who buys a flex or just in general 
don't make that your first radio. Do not like go out and like, you know, start the, the, you know, the iterator process of learning how to go from a simple basic radio to something with a little bit better DSP to something with you know, more functionality and then get to like, you know, if, if you want to make the leap after that, but then you understand what the technology and the underlying stuff that goes with it. So when you get to the flex side, the software side is just something you just have to learn. And then you just have to learn how to do the switching and, and, you know, some of the other filtering company, uh, you know, uh, tool sets. But my biggest struggle was, is that once I started getting it plugged back into my system, it really was just like, I, I couldn't get it. Like I spent a lot of time with the help desk support and which are great. Um, but in essence, they couldn't get my, the digital audio workstation working with my flex. So I couldn't use my microphone on my desk and, and that wasn't their fault. They spent a lot of time with me working through that process, but it just turned out to be that I just determined it was just the, the, the digital audio workstation that wasn't working. And I really needed a good soundboard to, to make it happen. And that's, you know, <laughs> where I'm kind of at now, but it didn't hinder me because I can still use the microphone and I'm still making contacts and, you know, so it's a small little bump, but that's, you know, kind of the only regret that I kind of had was it's just a little bit of a challenge and a learning curve. Cool. Todd, how about yourself? Well, I'm too new at it to have uh, a lot, any kind of things that are regretful um, or something I didn't like. I mean, one thing I, I, when I started doing, trying to do all the filtering in the very beginning, I started adding all these things in and, and like I had lines everywhere and I kind of wish there was like a reset button that I could just say, go back to where I started. <laughs> um, but I did find out where it is to like manually delete, but you can just keep putting in these notches sure. and, and filter out the whole thing. Um, but like I said, it's I, I need a lot more time with the radio to kind of master like what everything does. I mean, and there's not a lot like it's not like overwhelming. Like you're like, oh, what is all this stuff? Everything is right in front of you. I mean, it's like it's not it's it's not like you have to go searching for stuff. It's like there, it's just there. Um, but, you know, it's that would be my only thing is like maybe if there was like a, a default to like if you set your radio at like your default thing, because like, you know, like on a, on my DX10 if I'm doing filtering, right. Mm -hmm. And I have, you know, all the stuff on, I can just go and hit the buttons and it turns it all off. Right. right. And then I'm back to where I started. Well, the flex it's, it's not, you just can't hit buttons and turn stuff back off. It's well, like you, you can, it's called profiles, but you don't know about profiles yeah. until you realize that, Oh yeah, right. I haven't actually solved the problem. <laughs> yeah. I haven't gotten to that point. So yeah, you're right. So Eric was telling me about this. I got some more videos to watch. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure that any issues that I have, there's solutions to it. I just haven't found them yet. And that, that's mm -hmm. just my fault for not digging deep enough. But I can tell you one of the things that I, I, I haven't been able to do that I wanted to do is when I've been traveling, uh, when I was down in Florida, I was trying to, I was activating a park and I wanted to see if you guys could hear me. So mm -hmm. I you know, got on my band and I turned my phone on, got onto my flex, which is up in New Hampshire. And I put the, um, I, I, I tried to call out and no one would hear me. So or I couldn't hear myself. So I said, okay, they can't hear me. But then when I would flip down to like, say 15 meters, then I'd hear a faint signal. So I knew that you guys might be able to hear me. So that was kind of uh that's kind of a cool thing you can do is like, if you're remote somewhere far away from your shack, you might right. be able to hear yourself uh, recording, but uh but besides that, I mean, it's it's been a great experience. And like I said, it's I, I agree with Eric. I wouldn't I wouldn't have wanted it my first time because then I don't think I'd be able to understand, you know, a regular radio, sure. you know, like a like a you know a physical, you know, tactile button kind of radio. So, mm -hmm. but I think I mean I think everyone should just take their get their first radio, play around with it, learn how to do it, then get a flex, and then take their radio and make it into a go box. <laughs> uh, very cool. that, that is definitely way we're, we're writing the the you know, the manual as we speak right now so you know for step yeah. one, <laughs> go you know take out a health well, loan <laughs> well very cool so one thing that i'm aware of with the uh, flex radios that's really cool is just the simplicity of getting that set up in the shack you got you know your coax coming to the back you have ethernet you know rj45 plug that's it and then that's pretty much it yeah i think that's just incredible so on back my icom you know you got the various uh, usb and civ cables and this and that and try and get everything to uh plug and play and you know it takes uh i have to write down the settings make sure everything is uh talking the correct uh sequence and software and there's 
one particular uh, logging software which prefers APIs over you know a CIV cable. And I'd love to use it, but it's just uh, it doesn't play as smoothly with my ICOM as it would a Flex. Well, you hit it on the head. Like that was like I bought the DX10, and I was like, okay, we're gonna. I want to get into the remote side, so I'm like thinking, okay, let's use it. Look at the Yazoo's box. Can't buy it. It's like unobtainium. They aren't producing it. There's you know, and you're like, okay, well, the other software solutions are out there. It's they're just kind of like. I, I hate to use the term, but they're just like half baked and they're not like a hundred percent reliable where you can like be like, I can guarantee that when I fire up the app or when I do this, I'm going to get reliable connections. I'm going to be able to not have to worry about the radio getting hung up. You know, all of those things that you worry about because you're remote and you want the, you know, the experience to be good, but you also mm-hmm. want your radio to stay alive. You know, you're not like holding the transmit open. I, you know, I, that, that scares the crap out of me. You know, if I have my transmit open, there's no way I can remotely, shut off the radio with the flex you know night we'll get into some of that some of the remote stuff but um you know it is it's a, it basically uh you know a, a change of mindset when you go from physical radio to software based but you know like you said you know you you, you kind of like have to do all of the multiple cable connections to be able to make it all work and you kind of get frustrated <laughs> yeah, and even you know even programming in to have it work with uh, ft8 I mean, it basically just worked. Yeah. Like you, you plugged it in, there's a software you download and it doesn't, it's not even like shows up and all of a sudden you just click and it's there. So you're like, wow, look at that. Yeah. The first one problem it, we no, have taught is getting our logs off the phone because we have to email them to ourselves to be able to put them in our yeah. logger. <laughs> yeah. Right. That, that, that's, that's the biggest downfall is uh, the log on the portable, um, on the iPads and the iPhone, which is it's good in the cloud. So it works on both and it, it's a great logger, but it doesn't, you have to like send it to your email and then yeah, upload import it to your, it. import yeah. it to the log. But I mean, look, you know, we can't get that picky. I mean, it's not that bad, <laughs> but we also figured out, Eric figured out that I don't have to delete the whole log because that was going to be one of the downfalls that I had is like, every time I delete a log, I don't have any access, like whether I worked them or not. So like when you do an FT8 on the iPad, yeah. it'll turn the guys white or gray that'll say like, Hey, you've already worked them. Well, if I delete my log, then you don't they know, won't sure. know I worked them. Yeah. So yeah. now you can you can actually download you can download the log and say from this date on, you know, mm-hmm. now you make that your your export. So, so just out of curiosity, did you guys which um, I know there's a couple different models that the company offers, but did you get the one with the screen or without the screen? Uh, without Eric. screen. So yeah. without, yeah, yeah, and, without and the screen, more. it's a lot cheaper. Okay. And, yeah. and from what I, what everyone told me is like, you don't need it. It's, you know, you, you're going to do it on the computer anyway. And mm-hmm. now they have this thing called the Maestro, which is a, basically it's that screen that's on the radio that's portable. So mm-hmm. you can have all the buttons and knobs for the main features that you can, you can use. And it, it looks like a, you know, the, the face of any other kind of radio. Mm-hmm. It's very expensive though. I mean, I, Eric, what is it like 1200 bucks? Yeah. I didn't even look at the price. It's, 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 yeah. It, it's, it's, it's out. It's really, really expensive. But the but, problem with it, it's like, it's, if you want the tactile piece of it, it's just, it's ethernet enabled. So the only drawback to it is that, you know, it, well, no, it has, I think it has Wi-Fi, but they recommend it's not, you know, worthwhile using it, but you plug in the ethernet. So like, here's a scenario I'd say with that, that would be awesome to have. Like if I was in Maine for the week and I wanted to be able to use my radio, I just just drop the maestro and maestro down on the table, ethernet to the, you know, the router and I'm on my flex and I'm up and running and it's exactly the same experience if I was physically at my desktop and, you know, it, it's, there's no, there's no, nothing, you know, is taken away from the experience. You have all the control knobs and all of the tactile feel and everything and you have a microphone and it's literally just like you're playing radio anywhere. So, did Eric, what, what type of latency uh, numbers would you put into the? Uh... I would say it's so. As with anything Ethernet and being in the IT world, you really, you know, if you design your home network well, 
Um, and Todd's obviously a, a you know a good example of uh, you know having Ryan's expertise to be able to build out the network the right way. That if you're running you know a ten meg, I mean a hundred meg, you know is probably just the standard these days. So if you've got a good Ethernet connection to your router at home and your router's pretty well up to date and you have a decent internet connection, I'm not talking like an ISD like a, a DSL connection, but you've got like some broadband with you know some decent speeds. You know mm-hmm. this will run really well. I mean the hardest part. Um, and some of the, the pieces that's not really like, um, we'll say, uh, you know, uh, user friendly is being able to pop open ports, you know, on your firewall. If you don't know how to do that stuff or you're a little confused by it, yeah, it's going to take a little time. But the support desk is there to help you out there. They'll get you up and running and they'll, you know, get you connected. But literally those two ports is really all you need to be able to get your connection to your flex and you're off and running. Hmm. Very cool. And are you... Uh on your setup, Eric, are you using uh, your opening ports or are you using a, a VPN type setup? See, the, yeah, I kind of contemplated on that one. I think my personal experience and even some of the Flex folks in all of their, um, you know, videos that they've done, all of their talks on, you know, opening the ports, the, the, the way the ports are configured, if you know how to configure ports, you can basically set up your ports to be the set that needs to talk to the flex uh, on the inside. And then you can set your outside ports to something totally random to that, you know, specifically, which, you know, in being an IT security you know, person, you know, I, I cringe when I do that stuff. But in essence, I know it's only to the flex, the likelihood that the flex and the communication between the flex is all encrypted um, or at least pseudo encrypted. Um, that, you know, the communications is, you know, uh, using TLS and all that stuff. So it's, it's, it's well architected and well built. Um, so you don't worry about like having, you know, data being, you know, compromised or, you know, anything because your flex is really the only thing that's pointing to those ports. So you, you know, the likelihood of the attack vector on the flex is going to be like some hackers can be like, oh, this is a flex. I'm going to get on there and, you know, use it Mm, may or may not be a problem. I mean, they still have to have logins and stuff. As long as they, when they make their contacts, they're uh, properly IDing <laughs> and they yeah. send a Q, QSL card to your address. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the hardest part, I think, in in, in making it remote um, because it's not really like you know using um, PNP, UPnP for being able to do automatic port mapping and stuff like that, which is mm-hmm. a crazy and hard to deal with and and whatnot. So there, there's some networking involved, but you know, by the time you get to that level, you've kind of you know learned the network side of things. But you kind of you know you don't get that when you're dealing with the traditional HET type radio. And that, so, last networking question related to the flex, um, Eric, are you running it on a flat network, or do you have it on a specific VLAN, or are you kind of seg, you know, yeah. partitioning it off? Uh, I'm VLANing it because it just made more sense for me to VLAN it, um, mm-hmm. and in essence, that's really the only thing that I've got on that segment. And then I just poke holes in the local VLANs to be able to allow the traffic for my local PC. Now. Flex says, you know, in their documentation and whatever that they prefer that you not do that. Uh, mm-hmm. So unless you really know what you're doing with VLANing and you know how to be able to properly set up routing and and make things work and have them communicate well and, and you can read the logs and see what's going on in the background or under the covers, then go ahead for it. That you know, it, it it's just Ethernet. That's really all it is. Now, sure. I would say, you know, traditional home person when they have just their firewall and a, you know, broadband connection, just plug right into your router, you know, you'll be good to go. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, you, you'll know no different because, you know, in essence, your flex will just see the, the flat network and you're good to go. Very cool. So in addition to the ease of setup with flex that I'm aware of, you know, watching you guys get them set up, uh, another thing that can't really do too well with my radio, but I know it's a huge community on the flex side is node red and running various, uh, configurations. What would they call in the node red? The, uh, uh scenarios. Um, okay. Yeah. You flows. know, they call network flow. Yeah. Or flows. Yes. Flows. I'm, I'm totally fascinated with node red and everything you can do with it. And I know uh, a few of our club members have some very nice oh, setups yes. that really make it automated. Um, Bill, have you guys, have, have you had a chance to look into this? Um, I have done very little. I mean, I've scratched the surface of the process, and because it's only because I have to re-architect some of my Node Red instances. 
node red for all intents and purposes and you can go up to flex's you know youtube channel and learn more about it but really it's just kind of like an automation tool that allows you to f- create dashboards and feed you know all of your flex the nice part about flex and flex did this well and i wish icom and if icom and yezu and kenwood you're listening get your heads out of your butt and stop making things proprietary and start thinking open because in essence in five to 10 years, everything's going to be an SDR type configuration. No one's going to want to sit in front of a, you know, a console unless they prefer to, and because they're all mm-hmm. going to be a touch in the sky and we're all going to have the Tony Stark, you know, approach of, you know, being able to make contacts right from our kitchen, you know, you know, uh, you know, you know dining room table or something. But, um, it's all an open API. And all that really means is, is that they give you the whole entire spec on anything you want to slurp out of the radio. So if you want to know status, you want to know frequency, you want to know power, you want to know um, you know anything for that matter, you can pull it out of the radio using the API, and then you can write that to Node-RED, and Node-RED can come up with a creative, beautiful dashboard that will tell you the power outputs, allow you to press buttons on and off to turn your amplifier on, to turn the radio off, to reboot the radio, to give you mm-hmm. status. I mean, it's it's crazy because literally from my phone, and this is kind of where I would have to think about, you know, maybe thinking about VPN because at that point, you know, I'm passing a lot more traffic and, and whatnot on the Node-RED side, but from a Node-RED perspective i now got a web-based browser of my dashboard of my you know remote configuration and i can flip on things turn things off you know make contacts all from my phone or all from my ipad or just you know be able to control the station as a whole so if things go awry and i want to shut things down quickly hey guess what press one button and things just you know talk to the devices and kick the ports off and you know everything gets back to where it was before you know the cast the catastrophe struck I just think that's so cool. Oh yeah, and uh, that's a huge selling point on my side. Um, you, dude, you 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 travel a lot more than all of us. Uh, we thought we yes. you would have made the leap first, and it would have been like you know uh, you know Ryan lead us to the you know the <laughs> the promised land. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Um, are there any other uh, add-ons or additions that you'd want to add on with the uh, flex? You know, for example, like a, a transverter. Mm. You can answer that one, Todd, or I can start after. <laughs> well, yeah, that you can. I mean, some people do use a transverter. I guess, you know, I, I, I think the biggest thing that I would get um, first would be the um, the remote on-off switch. Um, I, I believe okay. Eric has one. I'm not sure if he set it up. Um, and and what, that would, what that does, um, or at least what it says it does, is <clears throat> if you're, for some reason, you need to reboot it, um, or you're away, um, you can turn your radio on and off, you know, via mm-hmm. your phone. So you don't have to, uh, you know, call someone and say, Hey, re- hit that button and turn it on. You can do it from wherever. So if you're having some kind of a problem, you, you couldn't close it down or something. And you know, the, the solution is, well, reboot the radio. Um, you could do that remotely. So that, that's something I think is probably a good investment. Um, I haven't had to, <clears throat> I've rebooted the radio just to see what it does, but I've never had like a, like a crash or anything where like, it's like, Oh, you got to reboot the radio. Um, sure. So, but that, that's what I would, I would consider as something to buy, you know, and then the wheel, you know, if you want that, that's, that's an option. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, but for the most part, I mean, it's, and what's cool about the flex and one of the reasons I liked it and, and Bill had told me, he goes, you know, once you buy it, you know, it's all software. So it's constantly getting updated. So you're like getting new radios and let's say they do an upgrade that you don't like, you can actually go back yeah. and, go back. and and go back a, a, an upgrade, you know, or, or downgrade and leave it at that and then skip the one that you didn't like if they changed something. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a big thing that you can, you can mess around, you know, it's like you get a new radio when they upgrade and who knows what they're going to, I mean, they keep working on these things and they keep coming out with, uh, with bigger and better things and improvements. And I'm sure that they, they talk to people and I'm sure they, when people call in and have issues, I'm sure they're putting notes down and looking to say, Oh, this is an issue. We should probably fix this. And then it'll be in an upgrade. You won't even know what happens. So, mm-hmm. um, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I would say, um, 
to kind of dovetail on what you were saying about the reboot process, Todd, the one thing that would be really like, and they flex uses this all the time. It's like, okay, how many of us have had the conversation about grounding and lightning and all of that other stuff? I mean, in the Northeast, we really don't have those major lightning strikes, but we're always worried about, you know, unplugging devices. So, you know, Hey, the one thing now is that, you know, you and Bill does this with the uh, WNWRI does his flows is that if he gets a lightning strike from his weather station, guess what happens? His radio goes into a steps. If that's like it's X number of miles away, it shuts down the connection, disconnects the radio. And, uh, you know, obviously um, he has a I don't know if he actually has the lightning uh, disconnect components, you know, to be able to disconnect his physical antennas from the radio, which, you know, when a direct lightning strike, it really doesn't matter. But to be able to separate some of that stuff automatically, you know, when something occurs is totally like a pol- like in my mind, like, you know, uh, a great feature. But at the same time, it's just a peace of mind because it's like, oh, I don't have to like, oh, do I have to be home? Is it going to be lightning this today? Should I unplug the cables? You know, or should I tell my wife to go down and try to unscrew the, you know, which I'll never do because she'd be like, whatever, I don't understand. Just leave it go. And, you know, she'd rather have it hit by lightning than, uh, you know, <laughs> actually, you know, saving the equipment. So, you know, having all of those capabilities to be able to have the software do it. And that's really the strength of the thing. It's just software. I mean, the, the hardware is mm-hmm. abstracted, dude. It's a box that sits over in the corner. I don't touch it except that if I have to reboot it. Now, it, you know, if I want to play around with certain things and plug things in, sure. But once it's plugged in, dude, I forget about it. It's like, a, you know, a server, a computer, an IoT type device. You just, you know, it runs and does its thing. And mm-hmm. uh, the software really becomes the power of the, the device because they threw everything they possibly could at this box. And right. you, know, you listen to their history, you listen to how they developed the process and, and, you know, how they're just like the, the top dog when it comes to like knowing how to properly filter knowing how to be able to take data, you know, this, you know, the, the past band in, I mean, you go into all their details and it's like the guys were like rocket science and just geniuses when they developed what they built and they must know what they're doing because the government buys their equipment and uses it. You know, a lot. So that tells you, you know, that, you know, the stuff that they're selling is obviously, you know, not just smoke and mirrors. But um, the one thing I really want to get into, and and it makes total sense, is these things come quick with the ports for transverters. So, you mm-hmm. know, what you do is you, you go find a, a, a cheap transverter, or you can go find a really nice Q5 transverter and plug that in. And now you can play in the, you know, VHF, UHF space and start doing some of the stuff. So now I don't have to have like an extra VHF, UHF 9700 on my desk, although that'd be nice. You know, ICOM, if you're willing to, you know, have us do a review, I'll be willing to take one. Um, but <laughs> make, make it yeah, exactly. We'll just do, you know, th- round it out. Three is good and we'll, we'll get back to you, you know, soon. Um, but ultimately with the transfer, you just buy, you know, you know again, again, it's, when you're at this level, you just it, it's money's money's money. Sadly, is the way you look at it, but it's all value too at the same time. So, buying a transverter gives you the capabilities to be able to two meters, four forty, one point two gig, you know, and be able to work, you know, all of those both FM and sideband from that same radio. And I'm not doing anything different except throwing more hardware on it and hooking, you know, an antenna vertical or a wire to it. Um, but my biggest thing that I do that right out of the box and I'm going to do it soon is, and I'm learning more is, you know, I need to get a receive only antenna. I've got two ports off the back of my radio. One of them Mm -hmm. I can, I can transmit off of one port. I have two of them at any one given time. So what I'm going to do is throw basically a, um, you know, a bog antenna and those that know what a bog antenna, uh, a good, uh, you know, discussion on it as if you go up to a ham radio workbench, they've got a most recent podcast where they, um, you know, talked about bog antennas, but basically it's just a receive antenna. That's like seven or eight feet or less than that off the ground. That's really meant for like when you want to pull the signals out and if you can hear them, guess what? You can work them. That's the old adage. So it doesn't really matter, you know, if you have the power, but if you can hear them on the antenna, then you're one step ahead. So you can easily set up a second slice with the the 6400 and listen as a receive only and if i can hear them on the receive guess what i'm transmitting and and i actually had an interesting experience and we'll touch on it in a bit but um being able to do split split is freaking easy it's like click a button boom you're done you're ready you know it knows how to calculate it, or it says hey how many kilohertz do you want to go up or how many kilohertz do you want to go down what is the deal and you know it, it just is automatically works for you. You don't have to think about it. It's not like I have to remember what VFOB is programmed in and VFOA is, you know, transmitting on or vice versa. And so, you know, it, it really just takes the the complexity out of stuff. Fascinating. Yep. Yeah, so, there's a, uh, go, go ahead, Todd. No, go ahead, Ryan. 
Well, I was just going to say on the uh, receive antennas and, you know, the beverages or the bogs yeah. and various styles. There's the uh, gentleman right around the corner from my house. He runs a uh, website for uh, listening to aviation traffic oh. on the uh, air bands. And he has listening antennas going all through the woods. Oh. And it's, it's fascinating. So yeah, you, that's on my short list of uh, antennas I put up in the backyard. And it's not a r- lot of effort to put a listening antenna in. And I'm realizing it's more and more important to put one in more now than just having a really, really good, you know, transmitting antenna. Yes. So, uh, you know, one of the cool things, getting back to the more simpler things with the flex that I found pretty awesome is you can have your headphones on and you can mm-hmm. also have speakers and you can turn the speakers on or the headphone off, whatever. So let's say you're, let's say you're, you have someone in the, in, in your, in your shack and they want to hear what you're doing. You can run the speakers and still have your headphones on. And then mm-hmm. what gets really cool and kind of complicated, not complicated, but kind of complicated when you're listening is you can have, you know, two slices going and you could have one coming in on the right ear. The other one coming in on the left ear. Then you mm-hmm. can do the same thing or have them both coming in on the speakers all at the same time. Mm-hmm. So everything is separated. Crazy. So it's kind of it's kind of crazy. So I, I've messed around where I've like listening to two different bands and hearing them coming in on both ears, one ear, you know, and it, you can configure it any way you want. Yeah. So it's sure. it's pretty awesome. But the fact that you can have your headset on and be working stations and then having, you know, your buddy or my son or someone who wants to hear it, they can hear it while I'm, mm-hmm. I still work on the headphones. So I know like a lot of times at field day um, when I got my headphones on and someone comes into the, where I'm operating from, I got to take the headphones off so they can at least hear me or they can hear what we're doing. Cause all they're hearing is me talking. Right. Yeah. So that was uh that was kind of a cool thing. And again, it's all software, but there's two volumes, you know, volume for your speakers, volume for the thing. Then there's the volume for the radio. So you can really, tweak it to however you and want you can so I, I thought, profiles too i mean you can go crazy and yeah. how you do your band configurations how you do your mic configurations how you do your global configurations it's it's insane <laughs> yeah i'm gonna i have to watch some of that stuff on the profiles because i got some ideas like i i wish i could and i don't know eric can you do that can i set up a profile that would only keep me in the general bands yep yeah well you can basically set up a, a not a profile for the general band specifically but like if you've got settings where you use this certain mic you want your eq set to this you want um 10 meters to be digital specific you can create a profile for all that set it all up and save it and then when you want to flip to it, you just select the profile and now you're configured for digital or you know say you want to right. do cw so, you can create a cw profile that type of stuff. right so that that's what i have to do because when i do ft8 it stays on ft8 yeah. and then when i go to sideband i gotta go and click and change it from the digital mode even though i'm in the sideband bands it stays on digital i gotta click that so i think if i do a profile i could have like an ft8 mode well, on each band. here's an interesting scenario. So we had a club meeting recently, and so I'll cut it short. But in essence, I had a, a guy who just showed up, new, not a new ham, but been ham for a while, had just only been a, soft, a short way listener. And I'm like, well, you know, hey, you should listen to 20 meter band. It's really busy. He's like, what's a 20 meter band? And I'm like, you haven't been on the 20 meter band. So what did I do? I, I had my, um, you know, surface p- iPad there. I had not set it up before. Literally took me five minutes to be able to get connected to my flex. I was able to pull up the entire, you know, band. I'm like, this is a 20 meter band. Here's a couple of signals. He's like, are you serious? Wow. He was like, he's totally like blown away that, you know, the 20 meter <laughs> band that he's got a license for that, you know, he hasn't been on because he's just been a shortwave listeners all to his avail. And I'm like, yeah, you can listen to this or you could do, I'm like, do you know what FT80 is? I'm like, no, I don't know what FT8 is. I'm like, well, let me show you. And I was able to pull up WSJTX and have it using the digital audio, um, you know, component in, in, in uh, Flex send all my mm-hmm. FTA traffic over the internet to my flex to be able to make an FTA contact. That's freaking phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Okay. The uh, other, the other, other thing just before uh, we switch, one of the things I love about the flex radio is the waterfall. Yeah. It has to be the best waterfall I've ever seen on any radio. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. Guaranteed. Especially when you can split several slices and see several Mm -hmm. waterfalls for different bands and not have to worry about it. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Very cool. Well, this has uh, been very uh, enlightening conversation. Uh, How much much closer are you to buying? (laughs) I'm not going to say if 
It's it's a matter of it's when. Yeah. I, I just don't know when. <laughs> so stay tuned for part two when we discuss Ryan's. We'll start a timer. Flex radio. There there will be a yeah. pool set up, and those that want to chime in, you know, you can donate to uh, buy us a beer, and you know, we'll make sure that it gets credited, and whoever wins the pool will <laughs> get it. We'll get it. Well, you sure. know, Ryan, I, I, I'd be excited to see how well you like when you when you eventually get your flex and you hook it up to your antenna, how much better it is versus you know what you're using now yeah because because i that will be, yeah the comp a b comparison will be interesting because uh you know I'm, I'm still i mean to be honest there my icon does a whole bunch oh. and i'm still learning the, the basics of the icon and you know there was a, a dx expedition a couple months ago and they're working split and is you know, i don't work split too often so i was like oh i want got to remember how I use split function on the radio. So there's still a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I haven't even done ready on the radio yet. So, yeah. um, I don't know. I, I'm not in a big rush to change, but I am fascinated with all the, uh, new functions of the flex. So right, <laughs> let me, let me just entice you a little bit. Remember how you had bought that, you know, com port virtual device that you just kind of was ready to pull the rest of your hair out and throw it over in the corner. Yes. With flex and DAX, I am literally able to run AC log, ham radio deluxe, and a couple other things just by setting up a quick port and then saying, hey, guess what? Send traffic that way. And ham radio deluxe says, hey, I'm hearing stuff from WSJTX now. And AC log is also hearing stuff from WSJTX. And guess what? They're all hearing everything and no one's complaining or bitching about, you know, oh, well, this driver's not working and, you know, I can't see this anymore. And it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have to fight with loggers anymore. This is awesome. <laughs> Yes. It just yeah. it's like it just works, yeah. right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's like <laughs> Yeah. I I, I want to throw the caveat out is that I don't want to dismiss the old, the heterodyne type radio. Now it, it, it is great radio. I that's where I cut my teeth. I remember playing with knobs. The tactile feel is just fun to be in front of. But when you want something to work, that's where flex just shines. It's like, it just does its thing. And if you want to make that contact, guess what? You're working on making that DX contact. You're not making the, Oh my gosh, why do you want this damn radio connecting? You know? So yeah. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, you fight a lot of the, you know, you, you do less fighting of technology and more of just, you know, playing radio. And that's where flex, I think shines. Yeah. Very cool. Well, this is a, a great discussion. This is a uh, very cool. We'll have to, uh, in the future, you know, as you get your uh, node red flows uh, built and new additions to trans versus, yeah, you know, various hardware and everything, we'll uh, we'll circle back around. Yeah, we but. we should have Kyle, who's a A zero Z. He's a big node red guy and developed a lot of the flows, oh, yes. and he knows that stuff inside and out. So he'd be great to have on. Very cool. Cool. Well, well, we'll wrap this up by saying thank you for joining the Live Free and Ham podcast community. Remember, if you haven't subscribed, you can. Uh, connect with the show by leaving us a uh, review on iTunes or on our website and various social media outlets. Um, there's a lot of ways to connect with us. You can also buy us a uh, beer or a coffee through our Patreon link. Find that on the website. And uh, if you'd like to connect with any of our hosts, Eric, how can they uh, get a hold of you? Yeah, as always, the easiest thing is just go to Live Free and Ham, but you can get me at n1jur.com. All right, Todd. And I'm at w1stj.com. All right. Very good. And you can find my website at w1snh.com. So I'd like to say uh, thank you to everyone for listening and seven threes. Seven threes.